Welcome. Welcome back to the afternoon session uh, on comorbidities. We have two excellent speakers in this session, Kara Wilson from the University of Colorado and uh, Marius Truset from the University of Oslo in Norway. And I will be introducing Kara, one second. Dr. Kara Wilson is professor of medicine in the division of infectious disease at the University of Colorado at Denver and holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology. She received her medical degree from the University of Virginia School of Medicine and completed her residency training in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. She subsequently uh, completed infectious disease uh, a fellowship training at Massachusetts General Hospital. Her laboratory studies the human immune response to HIV um, infection and the factors that drive HIV pathogenesis, particularly in the intestinal mucosal tissue. Her most recent studies have focused on understanding the complex interactions between virus, gut commensal bacteria, and immune uh, intestinal immune cells that contribute to muc mucosal and systemic inflammation during HIV infection. She also has extensive experience in designing and implementing HIV clinical trials through her involvement in the National AIDS Clinical Trials Group, ACTG, with an emphasis on studies of HIV-associated immune activation and immune-based vaccine and therapies. Take it away, Kara. Um, hello. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this conference today. I only wish that we could be in person, uh, but I look forward to our Zoom conversation uh, at the end. So today I'll be talking to you about um, intestinal cytotoxic CD4 T cells uh, and their associations with immune activation and dysbiosis and untreated HIV infection. I have no disclosures uh, to present today. Chronic inflammation is a key feature of HIV pathogenesis, and uh, the gut is uh, clearly an important source of this inflammation. HIV infection disrupts intestinal immune homeostasis in a number of different, via a number of different mechanisms. Uh, first of all, HIV replicates to very high levels in gut-associated lymphoid tissue in early HIV infection, resulting in the infection and then depletion of uh, um, a large number of CD4 T cells, including Th17 and Th22 subsets. Uh, this results in immune activation of bystander cells, including other T cells, dendritic cells, and innate lymphoid cells, ultimately resulting in mucosal inflammation with aberrant cytokine production. Now this um, inflammatory state feeds back on the epithelial barrier, causing it to be leaky and ulti ultimately resulting in microbial translocation. Uh, likewise, this epithelial barrier disruption uh, leads to a, a microenvironment that promotes microbial dysbiosis uh, with changes in the community structure uh, of the mucosal uh, microbiome. Uh, this has been characterized in many cases by an increase in pathobiont bacteria and a decrease in immune regulatory bacteria. The overall research objective of my lab is to understand host microbe interactions in the setting of HIV infection, uh, and parti in particular, how they contribute to chronic immune activation. And we do this um, in using two different types of uh, study approaches. Uh, first, we look at, we do clinical studies in which we describe or evaluate uh, human immune, virologic, and microbial um, parameters, um, both in the gut and in the blood. Um, and that uh, we look at relationships there. Uh, and then we also, to get more mechanistic and to look for dynamics, we do in vitro modeling of um, human immune cells, HIV, bacteria, and their metabolites, um, and again, and tissue culture. And we use these two methods of, of study to inform one another and to help us address more mechanistic uh, questions in the setting of HIV infection. So the work that I'm gonna to describe today uh, really resulted from a sort of serendipitous finding from a, a previously published transcriptomic study. Um, this was just uh, published in Lost Pathogens in 2017. 
and we were attempting there to look at the transcriptome of HIV infected intestinal CD4 T cells that were exposed to enteric bacteria. And in that study, we looked at lamina propria mononuclear cells from, uh, from a human um, gut, and we infected them with an HIV strain that expressed a green fluorescent protein. And then we exposed them to um, a bacteria, Prevacetella stercoria, which is an enteric um, bacteria that we had found to be elevated in the mucosa of HIV infected individuals. We cultured them for, for four days, and then we sorted on the infected CD4 T cells. And we looked uh, at gene expression using a human um, affimatrix gene array. Now, an interesting finding um, from this study was that in those CD4 T cells that were in HIV infected, but also exposed to microbes, uh, there was this marked upregulation of granzyme genes. And what I'm showing you here is a figure from that paper with downregulated genes on the left, upregulated genes on the right. Um, and in red, I want to draw your attention to um, uh, granzyme B, granzyme H, and granzyme A genes. They were all upregulated, um, again, in these CD4 T cells that were exposed to um, bacteria and HIV infected um, simultaneously. So we wanted to confirm uh, that granzymes were um, up increased uh, at the protein level um, in these cells. And so we did a similar experiment where we looked at lamina propria mononuclear cells uh, that were again infected with um, uh, a GFP expressing uh, HIV uh, and then exposed to uh, P. stercoria in vitro. And in this case, we looked at uh, granzyme B uh, protein expression in those cells by flow cytometry. And you can see either by the flow plots on the left or the summary data on the right. Uh, the, when you infect with HIV only, uh, you do get a little bit of upregulation of granzyme B expression um, in those cells. Uh, but when you uh, expose them to bacteria alone, there's a much more uh, marked increase in granzyme B expression. And then the HIV infected and um, bacteria exposed uh, cells uh, similar to our previous transcriptome study, showed a marked increase um, in granzyme B expression. So I want to tell you a little bit about granzymes, um, and their function and expression. Uh, granzymes are serine proteases that cleave both intracellular and extracellular substrates, but typically they're produced by CD8 T cells and NK cells, uh, and their most well-described activity uh, really is killing of target cells uh, via apoptosis. And this is typically a perforin-dependent um, process. However, um, over in recent years, a number of additional activities have been attributed to granzymes. And those include promoting inflammatory cytokine production by antigen-presenting cells, cleaving inactive cytokines into their biologically active forms, and sometimes actually directly killing bacteria. Now, granzyme B expressing CD4 T cells have been reported in a number of different settings. Um, and primarily, they've been reported to be cytotoxic CD4 T cells uh, because they also tend to express other cytolytic molecules, such as perforin and CD107. Um, they're often described as um, recognizing antigenic peptides uh, that are class, MHC class II restricted. And um, they've been identified in a number of chronic viral infections, uh, as well as in some murine and human bacterial infections. And in, in particular, in the study of HIV infection, HIV-specific cytolytic CD4 T cells have been shown to be increased in the blood during acute and chronic inf infection. Uh, they've been described as being polyfunctional and expressing CCR5 and perforin, and in some cases, to actually contribute to antiviral immunity. However, uh, the extent to which these cells um, contribute to HIV-associated gut pathogenesis and their role in the gut uh, and in chronic inflammation uh, really has not been uh, fully evaluated. So to um, move this work forward, we developed some hypotheses. Um, the first is just that gut, we think that gut CD4 T cells potentially evolved um, the cytolytic potential to counteract transcating and or pathogenic bacteria. Um, in a normal gut, there's very little uh, granzyme B expression in CD4 T cells, but upon exposure to bacteria, this is very quickly upregulated. 
Uh, we further hypothesized that during HIV infection, with this breakdown in intestinal immune homeostasis and microbial translocation, the role of these cells could become overtly inflammatory and exacerbated um, due to exposure to both uh, virus as well as bacteria, resulting in sort of a chronic increase uh, in granzyme B expression. So we asked the question, you know, are granzyme B expressing gut CD4 T cells increased during untreated HIV infection? And to, do, uh, to answer this question, uh, we, we were able to obtain samples from a previous clinical study. We, uh, these were colonic tissue biopsies. Um, and we, we studied 10 uh, people with HIV infection that were not receiving antiretroviral therapy at the time of the study, um, and 10 uninfected controls. Uh, these study participants were selected from a larger cohort, uh, and we uh, selected them based on having CD4 counts greater than 400 so that we had adequate number of cells uh, to evaluate. Uh, and they also were selected to have the highest levels of gut HIV replication, inflammation, and microbial translocation, because uh, we wanted to make sure that we could look for associations with um, uh, both systemic and mucosal pathogenesis. The controls were balanced for age and sex. And this is a, a diagram, um, sorry, a table showing uh, the clinical study of participant characteristics. And as I said, we balanced for age and sex. Uh, the uh, participants that were um, people with HIV infection were pr pr primarily men who have sex with men, uh, whereas the uh, control group were not. So there was not balance there. Uh, the, the group was balanced for race and ethnicity, but um, the HIV infected cohort had slightly lower CD4 counts as might be expected. And um, you can see that their um, uh, average uh, plasma RNA copies per mil was around 25,000 in the people with HIV. Um, and they've been infected for a little over an average of three years. To identify colonic B positive CD4 T cells um, in the lamina propria, uh, we used uh, multispectral fluorescent microscopy. And we looked for granzyme B expression in CD3 positive here, CD8 minus cells, and this is granzyme B expression in red, and then you can see uh, here they're co-localized. Um, and we used this, uh, this approach because HIV infected cells downregulate CD4 expression, and we didn't want to miss those infected cells. So in a blinded analysis, we enumerated the percentage of these cells um, both as a percentage of, of total CD3 po positive CD8 minus, as well as the number of these cells per tissue area. So the result of, of that analysis in comparing um, the controls to people with HIV infection, uh, we found that indeed there was a, a, a much greater frequency and percentage of granzyme B expressing CD4 T cells um, in the colons of uh, people with HIV infection um, compared to controls. And you can see here on the left that these are, um, this is a, the percentage of, of those cells that are granzyme B expressing. And here on the right is the number per tissue area. And those were, they were increased in both um, types of measurements. And, and what was interesting about that, 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 that we, saw, we saw that finding um, in the setting of a really marked CD4 T cell depletion um, in the colon. And um, this is looking again at the percentage of CD3 T cells um, uh, that are CD8 minus, and there was a marked depletion of those cells in the HIV infected cohort. Um, and then this is looking at the cell per tissue area. So despite the fact that these cells were um, depleted, uh, there were still a much greater expression of granzyme B um, in that same cell population. So we next asked whether frequencies of granzyme B expressing gut CD4 T cells were associated with features of HIV pathogenesis. And to do this, we use linear regression modeling to look at associations between these granzyme B uh, frequencies, uh, as well as uh, compared to a number of different other readouts um, that we had um, evaluated in previous studies. And these include clinical, immunologic, virologic, um, and mucosal microbiome readouts. 
we accounted for age, sex, and HIV status in this analysis. And we also accounted for multiple testing using a false discovery rate. Just to give you an indication of some of the um, endpoints from this study. Um, on the left, you see uh, the, the peripheral blood and plasma analyses. We looked at inflammatory readouts, immune activation markers, microbial translocation, intestinal barrier, um, and um, plasma granzymes. And on the right, uh, we also, um, based on um, colonic biopsy um, analyses, we were able to look at mucosal immune cell composition, um, in inflammation by gene transcripts, as well as immune activation and microbial translocation uh, markers. We also looked at tissue HIV RNA levels. And really the result of that um, uh, analysis uh, revealed uh, associations between gut granzyme B expressing CD4 T cell frequencies and blood CD4 and CD8 T cell activation. That was based on CD38 HLA-DR co-expression. And you can see that the, um, the estimate is greater uh, for CD4 T cell as activation than CD8 T cell activation. Um, and what we're showing here in this graph um, is that for each 1% increase in activated blood CD4 T cells, the average number of granzyme B expressing cells per tissue area uh, increased by 16. So that's just an example of what we're looking at here. And these were significant um, e even using the false discovery rate correction. Uh, we saw these associations, whether or not we looked at the cells as a percent of CD4 or as a tissue per area. Uh, likewise, we saw associations uh, between significant associations between these granzyme B expressing T cell frequencies and um, both colonic CD4 and CD8 T cell activation. Again, this was looking uh, looking at the cells in the colon, uh, both CD3, sorry, CD4 and CD8 T cells that it co-expressed CD38 and HLA-DR. Um, again, you can see that these are significant by false discovery rate. Um, the granzyme B CD4 T cell frequencies were also significantly associated with two other um, uh, colonic uh, uh, findings or readouts. And those were colonic granzyme B gene transcripts and myeloid dendritic cell, uh, mucosal myeloid dendritic cell frequencies. But otherwise, there were no other significant associations with these cells. We next looked at associations between these cells, these granzyme B expressing cells, and features of the mucosal microbial um, uh, microbiome, and in particular, looking at taxa abundance. Uh, from, this was also using microbiome data from a previously published study from, uh, on these same individuals, um, in which the key microbiome findings were as follows. We saw that there were HIV-associated differences. All taxonomic levels consisted with dysbiosis, we saw changes in the, uh, at the phylum level, at the genus level, and in particular, an increased um, uh, Prevotella abundance, uh, decreased butyrate producing bacteria. And the dysbiotic profile was associated with microbial translocation um, and also immune activation. Um, this was primarily driven by Prevotella species abundance. Now, what we did in this analysis was very focused. We looked only at those uh, taxa that were significantly altered in HIV infection. So this wasn't an unbiased um, uh, microbiome analysis, but focused with the probably around 30 plus um, taxa that we looked at. And in one slide, I can summarize the results. Um, we, the, the only um, relationships that we saw with the granzyme B uh, CD4 T cells were um, related to Prevotella taxa abundance. And this was really across all taxonomic levels. So if you look at this uh, figure, you can see um, at the phylum level in the Bacteroidetes, there was a significant association. Uh, this, is, this contains the Prevotella um, species. Uh, at the family level, at the genus level, and then two uh, species that we found to be increased in HIV infection were also uh, linked to these granzyme B expressing T cells. And the interpretation of this graph is that for each 1% increase in taxa abundance, the average number of granzyme B expressing cells increased by 70 to 250 cells. Um, and um, we, again, we saw these associations. However, we looked at the granzyme B expressing CD4 T cells, whether as cell by, by area um, or a percentage of CD4 T cells. <clears throat> 
So to conclude, um, we believe that this is the first study to show an accumulation of granzyme B expressing CD3 positive CD8 minus uh, T cells in the human gut during untreated HIV infection. These cells were associated with circulating activated T cells, which is a known predictor of disease progression, uh, to mucosal activated T cells, both CD4 and CD8, and with mucosal Prevotella abundance, which we found to be increased in our HIV infected cohort. Um, and, and numerous other studies now have shown to be linked to sexual practice and other studies. Um, uh, so um, we, we believe that there is a link here between the granzyme B expression um, and some of these markers of pathogenesis as well as um, microbial dysbiosis. But there are a number of knowledge gaps or questions that remain unanswered. Um, those include, how do these cells um, contribute to mucosal damage? Um, are there target cells that they're killing? Um, do they induce inflammatory cytokine production? Are they um, destroying uh, mucosal tissue extracellularly? And is this granzyme B response gut specific, or would we also see this in the peripheral blood? And these are ongoing uh, studies that we're involved in. And then a third question really is, what is the antigen specificity of these granzyme B expressing CD4 T cells? You know, for instance, do they recognize bacteria? Do they recognize virus? Are they non-specifically activated? So we look forward to addressing some of these um, additional questions in future studies. So I'd like to end by acknowledging um, a number of different individuals who have been important in this work. I wanna acknowledge the members of my lab and in particular, and Dr. Seth Dillon, who has been really a partner in all aspects of this work with me. Likewise, um, Mario Santiago um, is the uh, co-PI on a grant uh, to, to look uh, further into these questions. And I wanna acknowledge him and the members of his lab as well. And then importantly, uh, we have um, one, I wanna thank the members of the biostatistics team, um, Emily Cooper, Harry Smith, and Katerina Kekris, um, who have helped us uh, with a number of, uh, you know, very challenging uh, bioinformatics uh, questions and study design. Uh, and then importantly, we couldn't do this work without the study participants, um, as well as the physicians and staff at the Infectious Disease Group Practice Clinic who helped us with recruiting. And then lastly, I'd like to thank the NIH for supporting our research. And I really look forward to uh, a discussion and uh, at the question and answer session that's to follow. Thank you so much. Okay, so in, it is my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Professor Mary Strosheit. Uh, uh, Mary Strosheit is a, a consultant in infectious diseases and uh, he is leading a research group on clinical microbiology and microbiota medicine at the Oslo University. He has developed in-house uh, analysis methods for uh, uh, microbiota providing pipelines. And his research in his group has mostly focused on, on the impact of chronic infections of the gut microbiota on chronic infections, participating in a number of uh, different cohorts. He, they were recently published the first data from the COMICS, uh, which is Copenhagen Oslo HIV comorbidity microbiota study. And uh, as well, they participate in EU-funded uh, projects, including the microbiota screening of anal cancer in HIV-infected individuals and have collaborations with groups uh, in China, the University of, of Copenhagen, where uh, they are uh, really doing an excellent, excellent job uh, investigating the, the impact of the gut microbiome on uh, comorbidities in, in, in HIV infection and, and other areas. So it is uh, our pleasure to have uh, here my site and please welcome and, and you can go ahead, thanks. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for this invitation to give a talk about the microbiome and cardiometabolic risk in HIV and non-HIV populations. I have no conflicts of interest. So I'll start with sharing some data on the microbiome and cardiometabolic risk in the general population, and then move to HIV populations and discuss if HIV is any different. I also try to uh, discuss where we are today and what should be the next steps in research. So there is a very complex interaction between diet, uh, the microbiome and cardiometabolic risk. And I've tried to sum up the most important topics on this uh, cartoon. Uh, 
Uh, and clearly, if you read the literature, uh, the most attention has been to this uh, uh, metabolite, TMAO, which is a potential link between westernized food, the gut microbiome, and cardiovascular risk. So in order to produce this metabolite, you need three steps. First of all, you need to eat certain nutrients, such as carnitine, which you find in red meat, orophosphatidylcholine, which you find in eggs, in dairy products, and in certain kinds of fish. But vegans do not produce this metabolite. Second, you need to have an intact gut microbiota. One week of antibiotics is sufficient to uh, suppress the production. And finally, there is an oxidation step in the liver from trimethylamine to the oxidized form which has been shown to produce atherosclerosis in animal models, but not if you add antibiotics to the drinking water, really suggesting that this is caused uh, by the microbiome. So in humans, uh, uh, TMAO can be used as a biomarker and it strongly predicts uh, myocardial infarction, stroke and death, as shown several times by the Stanley Hazen group. We looked at this in heart failure several years ago, uh, finding that in the upper turtle of TMAO, only 50% of the patients were alive five years into the study. So it's a really strong signal. And more recently, the Stanley Hazen group has also looked at uh, TMAO in a more acute setting. And uh, elevated levels of TMAO also predict uh, new cardiovascular events. 30 days after a myocardial infarction. And whether TMAO is uh, ready for use in the emergency room is still a question, I think. It's interesting that it seems to interfere with the platelet reactivity, but so far we, we have enough uh, established uh, biomarkers for, for clinical use, but it's still a very exciting uh, biomarker. But what about HIV populations? Is TMAO a potential biomarker for clinical use? A few years back, we measured TMAO in almost 1,000 plasma samples in a nested case control study of HIV-infected individuals with or without myocardial infarction. We have followed these patients for uh, several years from before starting ART to the last sample before the myocardial infarction and we find no single whatsoever of TMAO. So it's not useful as a biomarker. What we do find is an increase in TMAO levels after start of ART. And we find the largest increase in those starting protease inhibitors. So we speculate that protease inhibitors might in, in interfere with the liver stage. It's known to induce a lot of uh, enzymes in the liver making TMAO a less useful biomarker in HIV. So the second metabolite that uh, has really been emphasized in literature is butyrate and also other short chain fatty acids. So butyrate is a fermentation product from dietary fibers. It has local anti-inflammatory effects in the gut. And it's also the main substrate for colonocytes. So if you have a decrease in butyrate, you tend to have increased permeability in the gut and increased leakage of LPS and other uh, products from, from the microbiota. We got interested in butyrate after performing this uh, study in heart failure patients where we have reported microbiota profiles from two independent cohorts and we only report the alterations that we see present in both cohorts. And what is striking here is that almost all the microbes that are depleted in heart failure belong to, uh, to Clostridia, and they belong to the same uh, bacterial families. It's Lachnospiraceae and Ruminococcaceae. And these are known to produce short-chain fatty acids, such as butyrate. We also see that the overall genetic potential for producing butyrate is decreased in heart failure. And we even see that some of, uh, of the um, uh, microbes that produce butyrate seem to be lowest in those uh, progressing to cardiac transplant or death. So potentially linking this to prognosis. And if you look at the contemporary studies uh, of uh, microbiota in cardiovascular disease, uh, 
there is one common finding. It's a reduction in different uh, clostridia, such as Roseburia, Fecalobacterium, Eubacterium, Ruminococcasia, uh, Lactospirasia. The common trait here is that they have the potential to produce short-chain fatty acids. The weakness with these studies is most of them are small. It's only 16S, uh, not metagenomic uh, sequencing, and most of them are not adjusted for confounders. We found in our cohort that most of the dysbiosis uh, associated with heart failure was also linked to low dietary intake of uh, fiber. So um, diet uh, food free frequency quest questionnaires are necessary to adjust for in these kinds of studies. So how about the HIV related microbiome? If you read the published studies from 2012 to 2016, uh, I think there are some common traits. Uh, the studies report differently when it comes to biodiversity. Uh, a lot of studies finding lower diversity in HIV, but also some finding increased diversity. But the common findings is, as most of you will know, decrease in Bacteroides and increased in Prevotella, which we for many years thought was the HIV related microbiome. But then this study came, which really changed the field completely. So in this study, uh, gut microbiota is linked more to sexual preference than to HIV infection. So the individuals here, they are uh, sorted according to a prevalence of Bacteroides, which is associated with non-MSM. Prevotella is associated with MSM, men having sex with men, rather than HIV status. So after this, we had to redesign uh, the studies. Um, this is the Copenhagen Oslo HIV comorbidity and microbiota study, COMICS, which was recently published in Clinical Infectious Diseases. Here we have tried to define an HIV-related gut microbiota independent of sexual preference and other relevant confounders. And second, to relate the HIV-related gut microbiota to excess cardiometabolic comorbidities. So in the COMICS study, we have uh, applied 16S uh, Illumina sequencing on 405 HIV infected individuals who have been stratified for MSM and non-MSM status. We also analyzed 111 controls, uh, both from the general population and also MSM from a PrEP cohort. And the first finding from this study is that MSM and HIV seem to have opposing effect on the microbiota diversity. You see here that the groups with MSM, they tend to have a higher biodiversity, whereas the groups with HIV seems to have a lower diversity. So this might be one of the explanations for the opposing uh, studies published previously. Next, we wanted to look at the HIV and MSM related microbiota changes uh, by comparing uh, different groups. So here we have used a program called Metacoder where we build phylogenetic trees and we compare two and two groups. So for example, here we have uh, compared an infected MSM with HIV MSM. And here we have compared the general population with HIV non-MSM. And we propose that the differences we see both in this panel and this panel is uh, linked to HIV rather than MSM. So what are these changes? First, we see an increase in the gamma proteobacteria and the sulfovibrionacea, which both belong to proteobacteria. These are typical LPS producers. Uh, and second, we see a reduction in a lot of clostridia, a lot of these short chain fatty acid producing uh, clostridia. So this is what we think uh, or find to be the HIV related microbiome. And reassuringly, when looking at uh, literature, this is a very nice uh, review by Vukovic Sivin. Uh, sorting the previous studies according to whether or not they are uh, adjusted for MSM status. And those uh, studies which are adjusted for uh, MSM status really report the same findings as we do in our study. Increase in proteobacteria, 
increase in Enterobacteriaceae and increase in the Sulfovibrionaceae. And also a reduction in these typical short-chain uh, short fatty acid producing Clostridia. So next question is, are these uh, changes associated with the metabolic syndrome? First of all, uh, most of the uh, microbes that are increased in HIV are uh, potential LPS producers. Uh, the sulfovibrionase is also a potential producer of hydro uh, hydrogen disulfide, which is uh, a known uh, metabolite that uh, could be toxic to the gut. So this could be linked to microbial translocation and gut damage. And we see that this trait is associated with the metabolic syndrome, twofold increased risk for metabolic syndrome. And this risk is really driven mostly by the diabetes component, threefold increased risk, and also increased risk for elevated triglycerides and uh, possibly also hypertension. So we discussed when writing this paper, is this uh, microbiota specific for HIV or is it more a general trait that is linked to obesity? When we wrote this paper, we saw a contemporary paper in science that was published last summer showing some of the same traits re uh, related to obesity. They find that outgrowth of the sulfovibrio at the expense of clostridia is sufficient to drive obesity in immunodeficient mice and potentially because of increased lipid absor absorption from the gut. And they propose that T-cell mediated regulation of the microbiota uh, is a protective shield against obesity. So if this is the case, is it possible to find an interaction between uh, immunodeficiency and microbiome in causing metabolic syndrome in HIV? So all of our uh, subjects or most of them are on ART, but we have stratified for nadir CD4 counts. And we see here that the odds ratios are really increasing in those with a very low nadir CD4 count. The confidence interval is obviously very broad, but there seems to be uh, an interacting effect. We have also looked at uh, adipose tissue uh, measured by uh, CT scan. And we here also see the same uh, interaction between uh, immunodeficiency and the microbiome. So the HIV-related microbiome was associated with 30 square centimeters larger area of visceral adipose tissue in those with uh, severe immunodeficiency, but not in immunocompetent uh, patients. So finally, uh, the last topic is uh, gut permeability and microbial translocation, which is reported in several cohorts of heart failure and diabetes. And as most of you know, also is a topic in HIV. After this seminal study by Jason Branchley and Danny Duick, showing that microbial translocation is a cause of systemic immune activation in chronic HIV infection. And this study inspired a lot of work also for, from our own group. So in several studies, we have measured LPS and we have found it to predict uh, hypertension to associate with dyslipidemia, insulin resistant uh, Framingham score, and also trunk fat and the metabolic syndrome. However, no studies, uh, as I know about, uh, have shown that LPS uh, really predicts uh, hard clinical endpoints. CD14 does, but this is caused probably by activation of uh, the toll-like receptor for complex and inflammation. So could there be differences between different forms of LPS? In this uh, paper, we have looked at uh, hexa and penta acylated uh, LPS producing bacteria. So hexa acylated uh, LPS uh, is known to trigger uh, inflammation on the toll-like receptor 4 complex, whereas penta acylated LPS is probably more inert. And this is a probiotic study uh, from HIV where we see that after probiotic, uh, the abundance of penta acylated bacteria decrease significantly. We see the same numeric decrease in hexa acylated uh, bacteria, but this is by far significant. And this is perhaps be 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 because penta acylated LPS 
outnumber the Higgs isolated LPS producing bacteria with a factor of 25. And we also saw that changes in plasma LPS uh, correlated with changes in gram negative bacteria, which is almost entirely driven by changes in penta isolated LPS. So from this uh, study, we conclude that uh, a lot of the LPS that you measure in plasma is perhaps uh, triggered or uh, released from penta isolated LPS producing bacteria. And it's uh, perhaps not linked that much to inflammation. So finally, I'll show another way of looking at uh, microbial translocation by looking at extracellular vesicles. So this is a, a, a recently submitted work by uh, Beate Vesta, uh, who has looked at extracellular vesicles. She's able to detect them by electron microscopy in uh, cohorts with HIV, with and without type 2 diabetes. You see them here in red arrows. There's a strong correlation between concentration of these EV particles and LPS measured in plasma. And she has also been able to detect 30 proteins from bacterial sources, most of them belonging to proteobacteria, as we know is part of the uh, HIV-related microbiome. And when doing, doing uh, proteomics, we also see enrichment of IL-6 and IL-1 beta in subjects with HIV and type 2 diabetes. And we have recently shown that soluble markers of interleukin-1 activation uh, predict first-time myocardial infarction in HIV-infected individuals. Uh, they have um, approximately 50% increased risk of first-time myocardial infarction when this uh, system is, uh, is activated. And interestingly, we see some of the same signals in the COVID-infected patients, possibly because of LPS priming the inflammasome. So to conclude, uh, the microbiome of HIV and cardiometabolic diseases have some common traits, including depletion of clostridia and impaired gut barrier. But there are also obvious differences, for example, TMAO uh, being strongly um, predictive in the general population, but not in HIV. Major confounders include sexual preference, diet, and medication. And in order to move the field, uh, there's a need now for well-designed large cohorts analyzed by metagenomic shotgun sequencing and also exploration of microbe host interactions before planning targeted interventions. So finally, thanks for my coworkers at the Rikshospitalet led by Susanne Dan Nilsen and my coworkers in Oslo. And thanks for your attention. I'd like to thank both speakers for wonderful talks. And uh, if I could ask the first question, um, Kara, are the Granzyme BCD4 T cells targets, HIV targets or not? Um, yes, that, thank you for that question. Also, thank you again for inviting me to speak today. Um, we have looked at this in vitro uh, and we find that the granzyme B expressing cells following bacterial exposure are greater than two, two times more likely uh, to be HIV infected. So there is definitely an enhancement of infectivity in, in that cell population. Thank you. Rohair, would you like to ask the next question? Yeah, Ma Marius. Uh, so then in the clinic, we know uh, that we have how, how would you proceed? I mean, you're an, an, an MD as well. So in, in, with chronically HIV infected patients, when, when would you order a microbiome test to, to look for complications? How, how would you do it? I think it's uh, far too early to, uh, to move this into, into clinics. Uh, I think uh, from, uh, from the numerous studies we have done, I, th I think the most interesting uh, finding is really this potential interaction between a general dysbiosis, which uh, is linked to, uh, to uh, adipose tissue accumulation in those who have a history of AIDS. So is this, um, is this uh, a signal of, of a previous gut damage or is this still uh, some mucosal dysfunction which is causing this? I think that's, that's interesting. So uh, uh, to answer your question, I, I think we find no signal at all in, in those uh, who are using ART and have a normal CD4 content and no uh, previous history of AIDS. So 
from from our findings, I think the dysbiosis is probably most interesting and relevant in those who who had previous uh, severe immunodeficiency. Okay, and could it be could it be uh, um, so? How how would you use both CD4 nadir and 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 dysbiosis? So could you combine that into a single marker or or? Well, uh, our, our next step now is is really to do uh, uh, meta genomes on, on this uh, big cohort and and combine it with uh, metabolomic and uh, I mean to to also look at at the circulating markers and and try to use uh, machine learning strategies I guess to try to find some specific signals and and then try to to move the field a bit like uh, like Cara is doing to to do in vitro and, and ex vivo experiments to to see if if these signals are are really causing uh, adipose tissue inflammation, uh, etc. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's still a, a lot of work to do before you can move this into clinical work. Okay. All right, I think we'll go to the questions from the audience. Uh, this question is for Kara Wilson. Dila Pinto asks, do you know the length of untreated infection in these participants? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the cohort that we studied uh, in this pilot, uh, 10 and 10, were uh, the HIV-infected cohort um, had an average of three years since seropositivity, uh, but, but ranged from, you know, within the first year to up to 10 years, but around 3, 3.4. All right, a second question for Kara comes from Alan Lande. Uh, is there any link of the granzyme B CD4 T cells and changes in the gut barrier proteins. Um, thank you, Alan, for that question. Um, it's a really important question. We have not looked uh, at specifically at epithelial barrier proteins other than intestinal fatty acid binding protein. We did not see an association between granzyme B expressing CD4 cells and intestinal fatty acid binding protein or in plasma LPS, you know, a marker of uh, translocation implying a, a damaged barrier. So, but we haven't looked specifically at other epithelial barrier proteins. Okay, another question. Uh, could the bias in MSM recruitment have an impact on granzyme results? The microbiota is different between MSM and MSW. Yeah, um, great, great question, Kunjay. Um, that um, is definitely uh, something that um, we are concerned about, and we believe that these results really need to be um, confirmed in a larger study that's balanced for sexual um, practice. Um, it is interesting to note, though, that uh, we, we looked at a number of different taxa that were altered in, uh, in our HIV-infected co cohort, which, was, again, was not balanced for sexual practice. Um, proteobacteria, for instance, a number of different taxa in the proteobacteria phylum were, were increased as well. And we didn't see, we didn't see associations with granzyme B expressing cells with, with those, that, those taxa, only with Prevotella, uh, which, which leads us to believe there may be some unique um, interaction there. We don't know whether Prevotella could be driving this or whether it's just an indicator of, of inflammation and uh, that would be then be associated with granzyme B expression. Okay, we have a couple more questions for Kara, and then I'll let uh, Roher uh, ask Marius a few more questions uh, from the audience. Um, have you looked at granzyme B producing cells in treated HIV infection? Yes, we're, we're currently uh, doing that analysis um, by um, uh, histology. Yeah, in a collaboration with um, Alan Landy's group, uh, we have uh, samples from a cohort of um, uh, untreated uh, or sorry, treated and um, controls uh, from, from Rush that we'll be examining. And Delia has one other question. Uh, she seems very interested in your work. Uh, is the MSM cohort, um, is an MSM cohort or more, or more diverse? Um, not quite sure what that means. Do you, do you understand what she's asking? Is this an MSM cohort or a more diverse population? Uh, well, our group, uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure how quickly I went through the slide, but we um, have around 80% of our um, HIV, people with HIV infection cohort uh, were MSM, and only around 10% of our control group were um, MSM. Thank you. Roher, 
Okay, so uh, Marius and Pierre with you is nothing personal. <laughs> it's uh, no, a question from Nikki Klatt. Uh, did you actually uh, actually assess sexual activity in MSM or just if they were MSM? There is a major behavioral groups that can impact. Uh, there is major behavioral groups that can impact biology. Receptive can insert insert intercourse. Was this controlled for? No, I mean, uh, how, how they have sex and, and activity, we did not measure. It's just self-reported MSM. Uh, but we found it uh, important to, to try to, to compare um, at least uh, this MSM HIV group with a, with a similar uh, non-HIV group. So therefore, we, we included a PrEP cohort. So, so these patients are also, or these, uh, these men are also taking ART. So the the main difference uh, should at least be uh, be the HIV uh, zero status and, and uh, not the sexual activity. Okay, so from Lauren, is is your cohort on a Western diet? It's a Danish diet, so uh, it's a, it's a Western diet. Yeah, so uh, I mean, compared to Norwegians, uh, the Danes eat, I think, a bit more sausage and uh, they have more delicious lunches, but it's definitely Westernized. Okay, thanks. So, so from Delia Pinto, what is the assay to measure LPS that you're using? Oh, we have used the LONSA assay in, in our studies. And uh, as I said, we, we found it at least when we use bioinformatics on the gut microbiome, it seems to be more linked to, to uh, microbes producing pentaacylated LPS. So uh, at least we question, it, it's, it's probably a, a a measurement of leaky gut, but but maybe it does not reflect uh, the inflammatory activity of, of LPS so much. Okay, and then from Christina Somas, uh, are your results dependent on the type of antiretroviral therapy, especially regarding TMAO marker? Uh, we haven't measured TMAO in in uh, the COMICS uh, study. Uh, we lost a bit interest after measuring uh, this marker in, in thousand plasma samples and not finding any signals whatsoever. <laughs> uh, but uh, back in, in, in that paper, we, we found it to, to be related to, to protease inhibitors uh, driving that. And in the COMICS study, we, we haven't so far done any <coughs> Um, looking at the, at the different uh, ART classes, so that's uh, that's the work we'll, we'll uh, probably go on doing. But maybe after we have the metagenomes. Okay. I have a somewhat unrelated question for Marius. In mitral valve prolapse, you see um, uh, bacteria that. Uh, uh, could, 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 could you just repeat the the, the first part of the question or the or the sentence? In, in Cardiac mitral valve prolapse, you see bacteria that congregate on the, the mitral valve of the heart. Uh, would that have an impact on your um, the TMAO levels? Or, you know, could you think of some kind of unrelated question, but related to heart, heart uh, issues? I'm not sure, but I, I think um, it could be related to con congestion and uh, and uh, uh, you know circulation in the liver and so on. But if if it's, I, th I think there's literature on that. I mean, it's, it's the Stanley Hazen group, which is which has really done most of the, of the research on on TMAO. Uh, I haven't seen any specific on on uh, mitral valve regurgitation. Mm -hmm. Okay, just curious. Okay. Do we have other questions? I have uh, one question to Kara and, and to, to <laughs> the rest of you guys. I mean, we, we find that, uh, I mean, privotelites is probably uh, related to, to MSM behavior or, or at least uh, self-reported uh, MSM. Uh, but you find these very interesting uh, findings and, and there are several studies also linking this to, to inflammation. Is uh, is the prev Prevotella uh, entrotype, is, is it potentially harmful or is it just uh, uh, noise from, from MSM behavior? Uh, any opinions on that? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, and I think it's the, the combination of the, um, the Prevotella, you know, enterotype potentially uh, that, that we see with uh, MSM and HIV infection together. Uh, which is potentially pathogenic. Uh, I don't know, what I'm interested in is whether the Prevotella dominant enterotype that you see with agrarian diets, for instance, uh, 
uh, would have the same inflammatory effect. And one difference is that there, with the Prevotella um, enterotype, I believe there is also, to some extent, an alteration or a reduction in short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, Lactobacillus. I, I think I saw that in Dr. Kelly's paper, I, and um, and perhaps even an increase in proteobacteria a little bit. So it. I don't think that those findings are, findings are necessarily the case in the, with agrarian diets. I would assume you would have a fairly high uh, amount of um, you know, butyrate producing bacteria or short chain fatty acid producing bacteria with all the fiber that you're getting. So I think there, there are um, subtle alterations that when you put HIV in, in the mix, you then might uh, see more you know, inflammation, microbial translocation of these kind of pathobiont type bacteria. But it's just, I'm just guessing. Uh, I, I think that uh, the data from Ivan Buyovic, uh, Sijin, and uh, Irina Seriti, uh, I think that they were able to, uh, our studies, at least our study was, we were not expecting this association. So therefore, when we found it, the study was unbalanced. Uh, it was not well matched between MSM and non-MSM. So there's a certain amount of information that we can simply answer based on what we did. But they, they balanced very well with the Athena cohort, uh, the two groups. And, and there seems to be uh, uh, an MSM uh, pro microbiome profile, but also an HIV specific microbiome profile, which I think is, is, is very interesting and should be validated. And I think that Prevotella has a signal there, uh, even after controlling. So, so perhaps these are events that are happening at the same time. So um, there is a certain inflammation in, in MSM possibly, and, and to what extent understanding, to what extent is that making them more likely to become infected or, or, or not? For example, this is something that could be, could be very interesting, but it is much more complex, I guess, in that environment to, to tease out what's, right. what's well, there. Kunti has let us know that we are over time and now we need to close this session. Um, okay. I want to thank my co-chair, Rohit, no, and Sarah and Marius for their wonderful talks and discussion. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, guys. Thanks.